Good. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 ECHO webinars. Once again, we thank Project ECHO at the University of New Mexico for expanding our license to run these weekly webinars. In the room with me is myself, Wendy Spearman, Mark Sandra, we've got two of our speakers, Ross Hotmeyer and Franz Ram van Hennemann, and Graham Monk, he's again to be chairing as usual, and we'll hand over to Graham. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Wendy. Um, I'm sitting in the room with Wendy and Mark and, and the speakers today. Um, so, welcome to uh, this afternoon's webinar, uh, COVID-19 Department of Medicine webinar. Uh, we're having our usual format, which involves an update on the epidemiology of uh, the condition in the Western Cape, uh, followed by uh, input uh, from our speaker, uh, Ross Hoffman. Ross is going to be speaking on COVID-19 anesthesia and airway management. Uh, but before uh, Ross uh, gives us his talk, we're going to hear from Andrew Gould. Uh, you know, Andrew is a public health specialist uh, at the Western Cape Department of Health in the School of Public Health at UCT. And Andrew's going to give us a brief update on the surveillance uh, of COVID-19 in the province. Thanks, thanks, Graham, and <clears throat> greetings, everyone. I'm just trying to get the slide show into presentation mode. Andrew? Mark, yes. We are running your slides from, from the end, so you can start if you'd like. Um, okay, okay, perfect. It's in presentation mode now. Next slide. So usually when we present, we've, we've quite often presented the, the different components of, of testing, um, the positivity, uh, new cases, new cases in health workers, admissions and deaths. Um, and all of those are, trend, <coughs> are continuing to trend uh, downwards and it might be easier to view them on one axis. So if we go to the ne next slide. Um, this, this is the same data, um, all on the same uh, time axis, the gray bars being the cases, the, um, the yellow line being the test positivity, the uh, blue lines being uh, admissions, and the solid blue line is the admissions with confirmed COVID, and the, the dashed blue line is adding in the public sector um, uh, patients under investigation. We unfortunately do not have private sector PUI data. And uh, the green line Marianne pointed to last week um, is uh, uh, data that's been shared by Lee Wallace with us on oxygen, total oxygen uh, utilization by our public sector facilities. And then the red lines are the confirmed COVID deaths that we report. So this is what we, similar to what's being reported by, by the national minister and the red dashed line is adding in the uh, additional deaths that we, um, we um, that are COVID related or we assume are COVID, COVID related and I'll talk to those in a moment. Um, and then just uh, it's what's quite interesting is that both the test positivity and the oxygen consumption seem to be quite sensitive markers of where we had our, our greatest service burden and so those might be quite useful for looking in other provinces where the service data may not be as complete. Uh, next slide. So the, um, what's been quite topical recently has been the estimate of excess deaths, which uh, uh, are assumed to be COVID related on the population register and quite a lot of debate as to, uh, as to these. And uh, these are the data up until the middle of last week. And um, the last two data points you can see are showing a, 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 gen, a gradual decline in the total number of natural deaths. Um, and ordinarily in previous years, we might have even seen uh, natural deaths going up. So it's co consistent with the pattern that we've just looked at of, of gradual um, uh, easing of the, of the epidemic in the province. And it's, just, it's similarly the, in, the, in the province as a whole and in the, um, uh, and in the, the metro. And uh, what's quite interesting here is the, the measurement of excess deaths is taken from the, the baseline where we were coming out of lockdown um, and there's been quite a lot of controversy as to whether that baseline should be used or the solid orange line should be used. If we go to the next slide. Uh, 
Um, so these are the uh, uh, deaths that we've measured on the clinical platform in blue. So those are the um, deaths in hospitalized patients mostly, although some of them are reported to us where we have a confirmed COVID diagnosis, laboratory confirmed COVID diagnosis. The gray are uh, in um, patients with uh, South African ID numbers that we've shared with the Medical Research Council who've looked them up on the population register and have identified deaths that are in our line list of confirmed, laboratory confirmed COVID cases, but which we haven't um, ascertained. And looking through a sample of those, a lot of them are patients who've either died out of facility or did present to the EC or to, to primary care, but the death um, uh, wasn't recorded on our clinical systems. And the, the yellow are an estimate of patients who did, tested negative, but probably had COVID. And it's based on the, um, the sensitivity of the test and the pretest probability uh, amongst all of those people who died and were tested. Uh, so it's a proportion of the PUIs and there's no, there's, we don't have any way to uh, validate this, but we, we feel it's a reasonable assumption. Uh, putting them all together, the black lines are the uh, estimates from the MRC of excess deaths. And one can see sometimes the MRC are overestimating and sometimes underestimating compared to what we're measuring on the platform. And we would in any case assume that we were missing some deaths where in patients who died and were never, never had their COVID status ascertained. So our feeling is that if you take a look right at the, at the last uh, a percentage chart, um, over 80% of the estimate of excess deaths that's coming from the population register are accounted for by patients where we have a confirmed COVID diagnosis and over 90% if we take into account the additional PUIs where we fail to make a positive diagnosis. So overall, our, uh, our assessment is that the, uh, the tracking on the population register is a reasonable uh, reasonably tracks the our estimate of COVID-related deaths in the province. Um, uh, we can't be sure whether it's, a, it's the same in, in other provinces, but it is reassuring that it tracks well in the Western Cape. And this variability from week to week has probably got to do with the uncertain baseline um, in our estimation. Go to the next slide. So just to look again at this pattern of decline, which has been quite gradual over quite a long time, we're now looking over of the whole of July and into August uh, with this, this gradual decline. And we've, we've previously shown, if we go to the next slide, that the, um, there's quite a lot of, there are quite a few differences um, between different, different parts of the province. Um, the blue being the cases and the reds, the red lines being the deaths. And so if we view that a different way, go, if we can go to the next slide. and we overlay it, then we get a better sense of how the different, um, uh, the temporal differences and when, when, when the peak numbers have occurred in different parts of the province have contributed to that, um, to the pattern that we're seeing. So early on, the, the, the peachy color here is Klipfontein, um, the <coughs> blue and, and purple are, is Kailicha, there's Mitchell's Plain in yellow over there, and coming out to the end, here's uh, Garden Root, um, uh, 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 that's Cape Winelands over there, uh, Tigerberg, Western, Western there, Tigerberg there. So um, that just kind of provides some explanation for the, for the gradual decline that we're seeing. If we can go to the next slide. And then finally, I just wanted to reflect a little bit on hospitalization. And uh, we haven't had time to unpack this as much as we would like to, but given the, the other talks today, the private sector hospital data that we do get, we get from a sentinel surveillance system called DATCOV, which is run by the National Institutes of Communicable Diseases. Um, and they have a paper that describes what they're doing on the NICD website. And it's, although it's described as a sentinel system, it actually includes almost all the um, private hospital COVID data from the, the hospital groups that have shared administrative systems. And it is our source of private sector hospitalization data for the, for the province. They do have, uh, they, uh, by their estimation, 20% of the hospital, of public sector hospitals, mostly um, uh, a, a couple of uh, large hospitals in other provinces, but we do share all of the public sector data from the Western Cape with the DATCOV system. So you'll probably hear quite a lot of uh, analyses of the uh, DATCOV data. 
And so the, just to orientate this graph, which we show quite often, the red and yellow are the ICU, the red being the private sector ICU, which comes from, from DATCOV, and the olive and lime green are the uh, general uh, hospital um, admitted patients, and the, olive, the darker green being the, uh, from, from the private sector from DATCOV. Uh, next slide. So just looking a little bit at uh, ICU admission and trends over time. So early on in, in March and April, uh, we had quite high proportions. Uh, it was averaging one in five uh, early on. And it was about 40% in the private sector of all admissions were ended up uh, with an ICU stay. And uh, it has dropped now down to in, during the busiest period for the private sector in June, it had dropped to 20% and is now in, in August, uh, beginning of August at 13%. And in the public sector, the, it was always lower, uh, being 11% in April, and it's now 5%. If you look here at, the, at, the, at these percentage charts, you can see on the left the higher proportion of ICU admissions, although falling in the private sector uh, compared to the public sector, which probably means um, uh, different acuity profiles in, in the patients getting into, um, uh, into ICU. Um, so, uh, currently, um, Although the private sector accounts for a smaller proportion of, of all admitted patients, the higher proportion are in ICU currently 135 versus 56 in the public sector. If we can go to the next slide. And this is time from admission to hospital, uh, not necessarily to ICU, uh, to discharge or death, uh, comparing the public and the private sector. And uh, we can see that over, if we combine the two, um, the combined outcome, uh, this is fairly similar, the solid line being the public sector and the dotted line being the, the, the private sector. Um, but we do see that the, um, the time to death uh, is uh, uh, shorter in the public sector, which is consistent with the higher mortality in the uh, public sector ICU admissions. So we have a about a 60% mortality in, amongst those who've been discharged or have died in the public sector compared to the um, private sector. Um, I'm very cognizant that the centrally held data on ICU admission and interventions is very, very uh, scanty compared to what is held in other administrative systems such as the Bed Bureau, but most importantly, what the ICU um, uh, colleagues have collected themselves uh, in, in the um, tertiary hospitals. Um, so this is just, uh, uh, we thought potentially of interest because it's an opportunity to compare across, across uh, the two the sectors. Um, yeah, and uh, we don't have any data, the data that we get administratively from, from Clinicom on ventilation is very, very uh, incomplete. So we, we don't rely on those data at all, but uh, what's reported to DATCOV um, from the private sector is that 60% of the admitted ICU patients are on ventilation currently. And uh, that's where I'll leave it for today. Thank you very much. So thanks very much, Andrew. Um, Andrew, if I could just ask uh, one or two questions before we go into the main talk. Um, just the, you know, the, the, the flattening of, the, obviously the decrease in uh, admissions and mortality um, that we've experienced in, in the, the Cape Metropole isn't necessarily reflected in the provincial stats to the same degree, and that seems to be that some of the rural areas are still driving the, the numbers in the Western Cape. Which which are the areas that we are still seeing uh, considerable numbers where there hasn't been a decrease? I think it was the garden route, and, and are there any other areas? So currently the um, garden route is the one that's still the highest. Yeah. Um, and a couple of the metro, uh, Cape Wineland still has, a, has a, 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 um, a number, it's still contributing. Um, Eastern, um, just looking at the, the, the first uh, graph that I showed you of comparing the areas. Um, Tigerberg is still, um, so across the metro, it's actually, there's quite a few, Mitchell's Plain still, so there's quite a few that have come down substantially, but I've still, still got a, quite a lot of clinical events happening, but just at a yeah. much, low, much lower um, event rate and put together, um, yeah. it's, it's still quite sizable. What's quite striking to me is when, when we sit in on the clinical huddle and listen to the hospitals reporting back, the extent of easing which they describe uh, 
uh, anecdotally is greater than we're seeing in the numbers. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that, that might just be that uh, it's just so much more manageable when you're not pushing the boundaries compared, but there are actually still a sizable number of clinical events. And in fact, if you look, if you were to look at our clinical events globally, even now, even though it's come down to the extent that it's come down, we're still looking at between four and seven deaths per million per day in the Western Cape, which is right up there with all the, con with the countries that are um, uh, considered to have the worst epidemic, South Africa included. Um, so the South American, Central American, and South Africa. Uh, are, um, so the, although we've come down dramatically, and, uh, and I think we're all feeling a lot more confident with the direction of, tra of the trajectory, um, we are still in the midst of, uh, of, of uh, qu quite a number of events if we were, if we were to compare um, compared yeah. to others. And then, Andrew, just one last question. Just um, regarding the exit deaths, um, you, you presented to what proportion you thought those were attributed to, to COVID. Do you, can, you, can I flip it around and ask you, uh, do you have a sense of what uh, proportion of the exit deaths are due to uh, other conditions? Uh, and, and is there any data that can, can inform that? Because obviously there's been a concern with breakdown in chronic care programs for HIV, for non communicable diseases, that there will be excess deaths to those conditions. Do you have a, a sense yet of, of uh, what proportion and what number of deaths have occurred in the Western Cape due to, due to that, that, that factor? Yeah, so that's been quite, that's an urgent question that has been asked by quite a few people, including the MRC, who I think have come under a lot of pressure because of these analyses. Um, I don't have uh, exact answers for you. So there are analyses that are currently underway. But what we can say is that when we've looked at the Clinicom data on deaths across the entire Clinicom platform, we've seen that the, um, the deaths uh, excluding COVID are probably at the level of previous years, whereas early on in the, in the epidemic, they were actually quite a lot below previous years. So um, in, 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 uh, in April and into May, we were actually seeing fewer deaths from other causes than we were seeing, had seen in previous years, and now it's probably about similar uh, pr uh, after removing the COVID deaths on the, on the acute hospital platform. So, um, and, there, and we do know that there have been quite a lot of, of, of impacts in both directions of the, of the uh, response to the epidemic in terms of uh, other conditions such as influenza, et cetera, not being as, as prevalent this season. So, um, yeah, that's as much as I can tell you. There's no massive signal, but we're still doing the analyses. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Andrew. Appreciate that excellent update once again. So we'll move on to our, our main uh, uh, talk for this afternoon and uh, I'd like to introduce Ross Hoffmeyer. Ross is an Associate Professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine at uh, UCT and Fredericia Hospital. His particular interests are in airway medicine uh, and he's also got an interest in wilderness medicine. He's just returned from teaching a course in the Matrusburg. Um, and uh, together with colleagues at, at Fredericia, uh, early on in the uh, COVID epidemic, he uh, became aware that there would be a, 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 a huge need for an uh, intubation service to support the COVID services in our ward and to provide controlled and safe intubations for patients requiring a me uh, mechanical uh, ventilation. And Ross is going to discuss with us this afternoon the experiences, some of the challenges and some of the issues that arise in providing the service. So over to you, Ross. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Graham. And <clears throat> thank you to our colleagues in the Department of Medicine for uh, welcoming us uh, as Lisa up here in the rarefied air of the day floor. Um, I, uh, I know I'm in the Department of Medicine because the crockery is of much higher quality than uh, down in our department. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, we, we like to consider ourselves uh, perioperative physicians uh, in anesthesia. And uh, as Vanessa Birch once said to me, uh, and an anaesthetist is just a physician in pyjamas with a short attention span. Uh, having seen many of my anaesthetic colleagues on the webinar, I'm going to try and keep it within their attention span and then the physicians can groom me afterwards. Uh, so, yeah, the COVID-19. Uh, really, the, the thinking uh, that struck me around this began quite some time ago. In fact, uh, myself and uh, Professor Swanefeld and a few colleagues were due to speak in China in February at a conference. Uh, and so I, I saw this outbreak of disease in, in Wuhan and started following it quite closely. You can see here's a WhatsApp message I posted on the department group saying, you know, this could be the next major global pandemic, uh, which was uh, largely poo-pooed by my colleagues saying, don't, don't cause a fuss. 
Um, uh, I've blacked out their names, but they know who they are. Uh, of course, <laughs> what we did then see quite soon thereafter was uh, how China, followed by uh, some of the European countries, uh, Italy coming to mind, and, and then, of course, uh, the UK and other countries, were struck uh, by the disease uh, and by the scenes of massive numbers of patients and patients in all ways, uh, you know, ICUs being rapidly upscaled. And the question really to us was, uh, where can we fit into this and where can we best provide service, particularly using the anesthesia skill set. And I think the, the core area to me was the fact that our, our skills in anesthesia, which are traditionally used in the operating theatre and somewhat in the ICU, but also form a very important bridge between the emergency department on the ward and admission to intensive care, or <clears throat> for managing uh, the inevitable problem of having patients with the coronavirus disease who needed uh, perioperative management as well. Uh, our traditional model in this hospital, and certainly in many other places around the country, uh, has been that uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of a, of a gulf between a sick patient on the ward uh, being admitted into an ICU, and I think we've seen from the surgical outcome studies uh, that, that, that sort of failure to rescue and that ability to, to recognize and then get a sick patient from a ward into an ICU is a bit of a challenge. Uh, and we realized quite quickly that the, the medical services would be overstretched, the ICU services would be overstretched, and perhaps a very valuable place that we could then supplement that was physically getting those critically ill patients uh, into an ICU safely. Uh, we also recognize the fact that there are specific challenges uh, for anesthetizing patients, both with uh, preclinical as well as asymptomatic, as well as uh, clinical uh, COVID-19, uh, and a dramatic worsening in, in perioperative outcomes for patients who are operated while they have COVID-19. In fact, if you look at 30-day mortality, uh, this comes from the uh, COVID search study, uh, where your normal 30-day mortality across your anesthetic population is about 3%. And we're looking at a 24% mortality. And this is quite a robust study. This was 24 different countries, including uh, South Africa and some other African countries. And particularly post-operative pulmonary complications are very, very severe in these patients. So not only do we need to have a strategy for recognizing them, but potentially adjust our anesthetic strategies for dealing with these, with these patients to minimize um, the risk. So very early in the, uh, um, the, the COVID pandemic, we recognized the need to uh, decrease our elective surgery, partially to protect patients, but also to uh, increase the capacity of the hospital to deal with cases. Uh, this was to a certain extent augmented by the alcohol barrage to increase the trauma caseload. Uh, and then we started thinking about how we could uh, prepare <coughs> to manage these patients, both in the operative setting, but also as, as that bridge between uh, ward and ICU. Uh, I'm sure everybody on the webinar is very, very familiar with the, the normal modes of transmission of, uh, of coronavirus, uh, particularly through large droplet and, and uh, surface contamination. But very relevant to us in anesthesia is the fact, and all forms of resuscitative medicine, is the fact that our bread and butter procedures of airway management, intubation, and ventilation are also aerosol generating and generate fine aerosol particleized virus, uh, which can then uh, pose a, an immediate threat to the practitioners who are performing the procedures, but also to other healthcare workers in the immediate environment and other patients uh, in that uh, care environment. So to address safely managing these aerosol generating procedures. Uh, we lead very heavily on uh, examples of literature that was coming out of the countries who had already uh, been struggling with the disease. And we began to, to build a plan for how we would protect ourselves while looking after patients and ultimately protect our, our colleagues. Uh, I throw this up just as a reminder, we're very familiar with the standard uh, uh, contact and droplet precaution PPE that, that we wear while dealing with uh, with COVID-19 patients, uh, and then the upgraded aerosol generating PPE, which will include definitely some form of eye protection, a higher rated respirator rather than a, just a surgical mask, and, the, and possibly wearing uh, full-length gowns and other uh, protective equipment. Certainly, in the controlled environment of the operating theatre, this is a lot easier to achieve than the uncontrolled uh, environment of, uh, of the ward. And I can I can honestly say that we did a double take uh, after having initially said that for routine management of screen negative patients and non PUIs, that we would manage them just with our, our standard contact and droplet precaution uh, PPE. We had quite a number of anesthesia colleagues who were quarantined pending uh, spot results after asymptomatic patients were anesthetized, had airway management, and the next day or, or within a few days were, were diagnosed with COVID 19. So we, we flipped our policy, in fact, uh, adopted a policy of all intubations, regardless of uh, the COVID status or the screening status, are now performed with at least eye protection 
an M95 or better respirator, uh, and then uh, a gown, gown and gloves. For our uh, known uh, COVID airway management, there have been a number of different suggestions of how we can reduce uh, the spread of these aerosols and these so-called intubation or aerosol boxes, uh, systems using plastic sheets and systems using suction, uh, many different attempts to reduce the, the viral load to which uh, practitioners are, are exposed. In fact, uh, myself and some uh, excellent colleagues from the European Air Management Society as well as the Society for Air Management in the USA uh, performed a systematic review and a narrative synthesis on this topic which is now impressed in the BJA. Uh, and uh, in fact, we found that many of these, these barrier methods not only increase the risk of the procedure, both for the patient and the practitioner, through things like damage to PPE, but actually resulted in concentration or secondary aerosolization uh, of the virus. So it comes back down to using good PPE as part of a very good IPC uh, approach. Um, <clears throat> so really, how do we aim to protect ourselves around airway management and anesthesia? Uh, the first thing that I like to remind people is that uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. If we slow ourselves down and we're very deliberate, we end up not making mistakes, we end up doing things uh, more, more thoroughly. The highest risk really to us as practitioners is not while we are wearing all of the PPE, unless it has been incorrectly applied, but it's while doffing PPE when we risk the uh, we risk self-contamination. Uh, particularly for when we've done airway management procedures, particularly if we've done resuscitated procedures where we may uh, have airway secretions and other uh, very infectious uh, media on us, Doffing the equipment successfully so as not to self-contaminate and then going to contaminate other areas is, is our big risk. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on, on performing buddy checks on each other, particularly in a high stress situation of going to intubate a patient who's crashing the wall. It's very, very easy to forget things. In fact, uh, I have uh, gone right through doing a, fortunately, a non-COVID patient uh, for a bronchoscopy in the operating theatre with a threatened airway. And only when I finished the case did I realise I had never exchanged my surgical mask for a, for a respirator. Uh, and that was, that was because I, I rushed in and wasn't careful to have some body checking. Then, as always in high stress environments, but in particular when you're using PPE and using respirators, you can see in this image uh, one of my colleagues wearing a, a reusable respirator. Uh, we quite early adopted these reusable respirators with, uh, with particular filters, uh, simply just to limit the, the incredible volumes of PPE that we were going through, um, but uh, also because we found that uh, we could actually improve communication uh, by getting used to, to talking with these respirators on and make, make sure we had good closing of communication. Then <laughs> equipment preparation, mostly to limit movement in and out of a room and people touching services is, is desperately important. And then we try and get all non-essential staff out of an area, whether it's an operating theatre or a ward area, or at least you know, five to six metres away, including not forgetting if in a PUI environment trying to move other patients out of the way. Uh, before doing these, these procedures. And uh, there's been a lot of discussion about well, how long is it before it's safe to enter an area uh, after an aerosol generating procedure. People talk about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Actually, the, the concept here is that it's an exponential washout, which relies on the duration of the, the air exchanges in that area. Now, in operating theater environments, the, the uh, international standard is at least 20 air changes per hour. So one air exchange takes uh, three minutes. We know then from an exponential washout after five uh, um, times that, that, uh, that change period can be down to about 99.7% of the elimination of any aerosolized particles in there. So five air exchanges is as safe as wearing an N99 mask. In ward environments, uh, the air exchanges may be a lot lower. We know that particularly if you've got a ward with open windows, many from the breeze, it's a lot better than just relying on the, uh, on the ventilation. Uh, standard hospital ward ventilation is about 12 air changes per hour, so that's a five minute period, so you would need 25 minutes. Uh, for, for relative safety. And then if we are doing procedures in theatre, we try and recover those patients in the operating theatre so that by the time they leave and they go to the ward, they regain their airway reflexes and no longer coughing, we put a surgical mask on them to limit droplet spread and, and, uh, and we move them along. We obviously went through a lot of preparation and fortunately because we were uh, quite early in recognizing the fact that there was going to be a need for this, we had quite a bit of time to, uh, to prepare. Uh, and I can really speak quite strongly in favour of our National Society, uh, who uh, formed a COVID, uh, ex COVID task team that, that I served on, uh, who produced the most incredible amount of documentation and useful guidelines, but very much living documents that were updated as new evidence uh, emerged. 
An example would be our SASA recommendations uh, for error management of COVID-19 patients, which is based on the best evidence we have internationally, as well as our own experiences, and adapted for South Africa. Uh, SASA also sponsored uh, a videographer to come into the hospital, and we, we made some short training videos across a whole series of equipment preparation, donning, uh, intubation, extubation, and then uh, doffing of equipment. And those are all open access. So all of these guidelines and documents are open access. They're available at sasacovid19.com, and the video is up, up on YouTube. Again, it's not intended to uh, to be an absolute rigid rule. Uh, as uh, the saying goes, you know, the guidelines are uh, guides to the wise and, and rules for fools. Uh, they should be adapted to the practice uh, environment. And I can tell you how we created our system and how we've, uh, how we've adapted it as we progress a little bit. I think that brings me to the very important point that if you are in an environment where you are still on the, um, you know, have some time for preparation or you're still on the upward curve of the pandemic, this is a great time to learn from the experiences and have some of the mistakes uh, of others, certainly as, as we did. And then to borrow an aviation expression, one should always use a full runway. Uh, if you have time to prepare, then you should be preparing today. If you are already being hit, but there's a little bit of, uh, of room to breathe, then use that time for preparation, for simulation, for discussion. Uh, and, and likewise, uh, in coming into land, uh, you know, now that we're in a position where things are tapering off, we need to think about how we can use the little bit of slack that we've got um, to, to improve our capacity in case we run into a further, a further surge. Now, I think very, very importantly, <clears throat> we should be focusing on team training uh, and particularly supporting our nursing staff. And when I say team training, I don't mean that we must train anesthetists as anesthetists and physicians as physicians. I think we must train COVID teams, which involve people of all disciplines, to work uh, in, a, in an interactive fashion. And, and uh, silo busting really has been an amazing uh, success of our COVID response that we very rapidly started using tools <clears throat> such as in situ simulation. Uh, to train physicians, surgeons, anesthetists, nurses, porters, and everybody who we could get into a room together, uh, we, we de-classified uh, the role, so we didn't have the anesthetist does the intubation, we had hot one puts in the tube, and that hot one person could be someone of any discipline. And that kind of, uh, of uh, interdisciplinary training was a great uh, strength of us. I think we must recognize that good infection control practices uh, uh, the uh, infection prevention control and the use of PPE uh, is possibly where we should have been before this all started, and it's certainly going to be the new model. This is going to be something which is part of our everyday practice, uh, and we must just make it an absolute, an absolute habit, and we must be willing to call each other out and to remind each other uh, of safe practices. Then, certainly something which worked very well in our setting was to secure uh, our own direct stream of, uh, of PPE for our uh, COVID uh, intubation team. I don't mean uh, outside of the hospital structures, but I mean in terms of supply management, uh, getting our own supply of PPE and certainly using some reusable PPE directly from stores allowed us to quantify very, very accurately what we were using and allowed us to predict more accurately, which was good for plan, rather than just raiding PPE from wherever we were, which would made it very, very vague and difficult to, to assess that. We certainly, as I said, started using reusable respirators and encapsulated filters that allows us to re-clean them after, after every intubation and reuse them. We also, instead of disposable gowns, uh, quite rapidly started using non-sterile surgical gowns that could simply then be washed and instead of going through the whole sterilization process could be fed straight back to us. Uh, and then a final point is that I think it is absolutely crucial going into this that you anticipate the emotional load. We are seeing a caseload of very, very sick patients uh, and often very poor outcomes that most of us, physicians, intensivists, anesthetists alike, are not used to seeing. We're not used to so many of our patients being so acutely ill and, and dying. I think the experience of one of my colleagues quite recently uh, of, uh, of intubating and transferring a, a young woman to the ICU, uh, who then in the ICU quite rapidly uh, decompensated, there had many resuscitative efforts, and, and she was eventually, uh, she eventually declared dead. Uh, and he had, he went back to the ward uh, where he had to tell uh, the brother that uh, that she had died. The brother also being a patient, and several days later, our team was activated to intubate the brother uh, to go to ICU. You know, the, those kind of experiences are an incredible burden. We need to be open to talking about them, discussing them, uh, and and sharing the uh, the emotional load that comes with, uh, with with managing this disease. So how we structured our intubation team is we. Uh, we initially asked for volunteers, uh, and the, the plan was that we would uh, subdivide our anesthesia department, we would try and 
feed all of the COVID anesthesia as well as the emergency intubations to the COVID team uh, and thus protect a lot of the other pool of workers and the more, the more high risk anesthetists uh, for them to do the routine surgery such, such as which was left. Our team has changed in size a little bit over time, but most times we've had about seven consultants and eight registrars, uh, so about 15 people. There wasn't any deliberate split there. In fact, we have a very, very uh, level structure where everyone does uh, does the work equally. And since March, we've rotated about 45 people through the team in six week uh, uh, rotations. Uh, this picture is quite nicely illustrative. This is uh, four of the five people on a, a ward intubation, in fact, this is not trauma unit. Uh, you can see three people in their full AGP PPE. Those are our three hot rolls, so they are around the patient. And then our one not hot, uh, well, not hot one roll uh, is somebody who's wearing a, a 95 and eye protection because they're going to come to the door or be just within the room to hand out his cross. What you can't see in the pictures is the is the not two or the runner who's actually taking the photo, and they are not in. Uh, PPE because their job is to go and fetch things, open drawers. They mustn't be wearing PPE that is in order to remind them not to go and touch things in the clinical area and risk contamination. You can see we've got our, our trolley laid out, our hot trolley with our items that are going to go into the, the hot area to perform an intubation. Uh, another thing which has worked very, very well for us is fortunately we were primed for the use of in-situ simulation. Uh, in, in ramping up and in training people. This is something we've been doing in our department for, for some time. Uh, and we were able to then take uh, a mannequin, take a team, integrate people from other uh, departments. You can see this is actually in our medical emergency unit. We've got a mixture of anesthetists and physicians or, or emergency physicians in the, uh, in the simulation. Uh, and we are running through using the equipment, in fact, an anesthetic machine that we park there as a resuscitative platform. Uh, and, and both testing the system, testing the areas, but also providing training. Uh, and perhaps I can recount an anecdote that uh, the initial PUI award in Kruduskia was, uh, was C9. Uh, we ran a simulation quite early in the process in C9 at 3 o'clock in the afternoon uh, just to test the area. We found a couple of critical things, such as uh, there were no uh, Christmas trees, and the little enough connectors for the oxygen, we couldn't find one of those to connect our ambu bag to the oxygen source, and one or two other uh, niggles that we couldn't get anyone through the, through the security gate. Uh, we ran that simulation, we debriefed on it, and we had a snag all this, all the things to sort out. But we had our first COVID uh, activation 7.15 that evening uh, in the same unit. So somewhat by chance, but we were, having been able to simulate in the area, we had already solved the problems we would have encountered the, that, that night. Interestingly, that patient, in fact, um, was a 19 year old girl who had H1N1 rather than COVID 19. So, just to give an idea of how our workflow works, again, this is all in the, uh, the SARSA documentation that's readily available. We have a, a hot zone, which is where the procedure is being performed. That's either the room or the immediate vicinity if it's in a ward. Uh, we have an airway team, which consists of five people, so three in the hot room and two not hot. Uh, and a lot of people said to me, well, this is just not achievable. You know, we don't have five people to go do every intubation in our private hospital. And I remind them that if you're in a theater environment, you always have an anesthetist, an anesthetic nurse, a surgeon, a scrub nurse, and a floor nurse. That's your basic component of staff in an operating theater. Uh, an anesthetist makes a great hot one, putting the tube in, the tubing, and an anesthetic nurse makes a great hot two, who's your airway assistant. A surgeon can be trained to give drugs and, and watch the monitor, uh, which uh, is the, uh, the role of HOT3. I say that's a little bit tongue in cheek for my surgical colleagues. Uh, a scrub nurse is an excellent person to make it or not HOT1, like the person who's on the door and controlling actually the flow of people. Uh, and, and a floor nurse is a great person to be running a nurse who won't be in So you can certainly actually amass this team. Nowadays, when we uh, perform activations here on Critter Scale, we're talking now three or four months down the line, where we've done a lot of intubations uh, in many different wards. We actually send a team of only two. Uh, we've condensed the, the hot two and three roles into one person. We have someone doing the intubation, someone giving the drugs uh, and, and uh, assisting with the airway. Uh, and then we usually borrow one of the, the medics or the nurses uh, in the ward to be the, uh, the, the not one role uh, and somebody else outside their PPE to, to do all the fetching and carrying. So actually, because of the training and because of performing this, we are assembling ad hoc teams which now function almost uh, was seamlessly. And here you can see this is a genuine intubation. This was obviously quite early in the process because the ward's quite empty. We've moved some of the other patients away so they're not to get too close to the aerosol generating procedure. There are our three uh, hot people, and this is not one standing over here controlling the scene. And we've already placed our, um, our red bin for, for doffing of the, of the outer layer of PPE. That's an intubation being, uh, being prepared. 
So we have one person who's doing the intubation, uh, another person who's running through the checklist and giving drugs and watching monitor, and we use a physical copy of the checklist for every intubation because that helps us catch uh, little niggles uh, and, and avoid problems as they develop. And we have an airway assistant who's handling uh, equipment, turning the oxygen on and off to help prevent uh, aerosolization, etc. And then our not one is the, is the so-called doorkeeper, and the not two is, is the fetching and carrying. Uh, here's again another real example. This is a, a uh, unknown uh, patient, so a patient who's coming with a decreased level of consciousness of trauma units. And I can tell you that it's unknown because you can see the stats are 99, and that's just not typical of a, of a COVID intubation. Uh, in fact, here you can see there are four people in the heart area because we've absorbed uh, some of the trauma stuff specifically for, for, for training purposes. This is fairly typical of the, of the PPE and the setup that we are, are using in this, in this setting. Another thing that we adopted early and that I feel quite strongly about uh, is uh, it is very, very difficult to examine or to oscillate these patients without contaminating yourself. Um, we do use end tidal capnography to confirm our tube placement, but to improve our first pass success rate and to allow for uh, seamless management of unexpected airway difficulty, we've used video laryngoscopy from the start for every single case uh, and a standardized uh, bougie technique. Here you can see. Uh, and we're practicing that technique, and so we, we've had very really good first pass success rates. And Francois, I'll show you a little bit of our um, a little bit of our airway uh, data. Uh, this graph is, gives us an impression of, of what we've done over the past few months. You can see there was very clearly a surge of intubations, where I think we, we intubated a maximum of 14 patients in one day uh, at, at the highest peak, and it's now settled down to a bit of a slow rate. So reflecting some of the epidemiological um, data, what we have seen that accompanies this is as we move through the spike of, of uh, um, intubations in the mission's ICU, we're now steadily seeing more and more theater cases, a combination of tracheostomies for patients who have su survived the initial insult of COVID, as well as more patients who have got coronavirus disease who need uh, surgery. And so we, we do more and more cases now in our dedicated COVID theater. We've taken over the trauma complex and we are using the trauma theaters as a dedicated COVID theater area, which allows us to um, sequester the patients who are non-COVID into our main theatres of COVID into, into the trauma theatres. We collect a fair amount of data on the patients uh, and, and this has allowed us to improve our practices over time. This initially goes onto a, a paper CRF uh, and that's then captured into a REDCap uh, database uh, and, and I can share, I'm, I'm going to ask one of our uh, registrars, uh, Francois, who's joining me today, to share some of the numbers that we've got. Just a bit of an overview of, of where we are at the moment. So our COVID anesthesia and airway team has done just shy of 500 cases of which we've actually got full data for 442 in the registry. Uh, that includes 238 intubations of, of COVIDs or PUIs uh, for ICU admission. The, the setting is about half in the ward uh, and then uh, the next most common place about a third in the operating theater. This is looking at all of the cases. Uh, our initial COVID status is now obviously we're seeing a lot larger proportion that are PCR positive, but about a third uh, are PCR positive and a third are, are PUIs um, with that last sort of tenth that are, that are unknown. And if we look at our final status, about three quarters of the patients that we've intubated have turned out to be um, PCR positive. The indication is predominantly respiratory failure, uh, and then the actual patient case management, we see an incredible incidence of hypoxemia, so saturations of less than 90%. Uh, around our intubation at, uh, at sense. And I'll come back to that in, in a moment a little further. We also see quite a lot of uh, peri-induction hypertension. Many, we think many of these patients are uh, hypovolemic, particularly those who've been on high flow uh, nasal oxygen therapies and breathing very rapidly for several days. I think their insensible loss is quite high. We've had about a 3% incidence of peri-induction cardiac arrest, which um, is, is really quite high. We need iotropes at uh, about one in eight patients around intubation, uh, but only an infusion of about 4%. And that's because many of these patients respond quite well to an initial uh, bonus to get them through the intubation uh, insult, if I can phrase it that way. However, there is significant early mortality about 13% within the first 48 hours. Uh, and then obviously it's very difficult to speak about the ICU outcomes because there are still so many patients going through the system. Uh, certainly we've seen so far about 15% survival of patients who've been intubated. Remember that these are cases who have failed high flow oxygen therapy. These are the sickest of the sick patients. So 15% survival in fact is not really uh, that bad, but there's a, there's a good number of cases that are still, still ongoing. I think what I'll do is I'll hand over to Francois to just talk a little bit about the specifics of some of our cases. Okay, uh, thanks Russ. Let's just get this. 
Yeah, as Ross mentioned, uh, I'm from so one of the registrars and anesthetics departments. I'm just going to present some data on behalf of the many people who are involved in data collection for this registry. Um, so first off here, uh, the, the case numbers and case types, as you can see, the vast majority have been intubations for ICU, um, followed by uh, COVID or, or uh, PUI theatre cases. And that reflects uh, basically what Russ was talking about earlier, uh, what the anticipated need for the airway team would be. That's followed by a couple of cases and increasing numbers of tracheostomies that are, are being done in uh, ICU and in theatre, and then intubations for trauma patients are not necessarily uh, known to be uh, PUIs. Um, and in a variety of other cases. Um, location type, there have been, the uh, majority of the patients have been in the COVID wards, um, followed closely by cases that have been in theatre, and then some in, uh, in ICU, which are the, uh, you know, tube exchanges and that sort of thing, um, as well as tracheostomies, and then the trauma cases that have also been mentioned. And the important thing to note about this is uh, the fact that there are many different locations where these intubations need to, to occur. And um, the team that undertakes this kind of thing needs to be fairly adaptable to the location in which they're going to be working. And the backbone behind that was a well thought out protocol and checklist that was instituted along with good training that happened with the team. So various people could uh, you know, fill in different roles at different times and in different situations. And along with that, there's been a familiarity with the ward environment or ICU environment, as well as the, the different people and team members that are working in those, in those wards in various environments. Just looking at some patient de demographics, you can see that there's quite a um, broad range uh, in terms of patient age. I'm just going to skip to the next uh, slide here. In terms of this uh, uh, graph or bar graph, you can see that there's a sort of slightly skewed uh, bell shape and uh, our patients haven't actually necessarily been uh, that old, uh, sitting between mostly 50 to 60 years of age. And then with regards to gender, you can see we've got slightly skewed statistics uh, towards the, the female gender. And that's probably reflective of the fact that we're doing a lot of cases in uh, maternity, um, which are obviously all female patients. So this isn't specific to patients that are being intubated for ICU. With regards to comorbidities, um, we can see there are a significant uh, number of patients with no known comorbidities, but then the usual suspects also uh, hypertension, diabetes, and high BMI. So with regards to induction agents, um, there have been a you know, fairly uh, equal distribution between the use of etomidates and propofol in these patients. Um, you know, as time has gone on, we realize that myocardial dysfunction is obviously of great concern in these severely ill patients, and there's been a uh, sort of predisposition to using etomidate for that reason. Probably the, the higher use of propofol is indicative of the theater cases that we've been doing as well. Um, and then there have been a couple of cases where ketamine has been used. So just expanding further on that, um, with regards to the association uh, between induction agent and peri-intubation blood pressure, you can see uh, this box and whisker uh, plot here. On the left-hand side is for propofol, and we can see systolic and diastolic blood pressures on the far left, and that's their baseline. And then uh, post-induction, um, we can see, or post-intubation, systolic and diastolic blood pressures. So there's a slight drop in both of those values. Uh, and when compared to Dominate, you see less of a drop. Although the propofol uh, decline in blood pressure post-intubation is not uh, as great as it may have been expected. As Ross mentioned previously, uh, there was a decision made early on to use varioloringoscopy for all of the cases, or as many of the cases as possible. Um, and because of that, we've had the vast majority of our cases Cormacahan grade one, which is greatly assisted rapid intubation um, uh, and ventilation after that. As you'll see later on, uh, you know, any sort of delay between induction and uh, intubation and then ventilation and oxygenation can result in quite a significant uh, hypoxemia. Which brings me to, to this. So peri-intubation oxygen saturation. This basically tells a story from the left to the right. Um, with regards to what happens to our patients' uh, oxygenation. 
So baseline saturation, you can see most of the patients have been sitting around about 80% um, when we arrive at the bedside. With pre-oxygenation, uh, we are able to get the, the saturation up to about 90% in the majority of our patients, but you can see some outliers there um, with, you know, who one struggles to get, um, you know, significant improvements in their um, pre-induction uh, saturation. And then the next box is the saturation nadir. And from that, you can see a very significant drop uh, in saturation as soon as the patient's uh, uh, ventilatory efforts have ceased. Uh, and that's despite quite a slick and well, uh, you know, trained team and rapid intubation. They desaturate very rapidly. Um, and then once put on the ventilator and oxygenated, their, their saturation does improve significantly back up to the sort of 90 to 95% mark. So we were looking at possible associations between saturation, nadir, and mortality, and it does seem to be the case here. And what one can see from this is on the right-hand side, most of the patients um, who have uh, survived or are, you know, there's no outcome at this stage yet, their um, saturation, nadir, was sitting around about 75 uh, to 80%, whereas those patients who demised their saturation nadir was, was significantly lower, around about 45%. What shows less of a correlation is our best preoperative saturation um, and patients who uh, survived or, or demised. So on the left-hand side, we can see um, the highest pre-oxygenation saturation in those patients who did not survive uh, was only sitting above 80%, but not significantly higher, just above 90% for those patients who, who, whose outcome has not been uh, finalized at this stage. And then the last slide that I'm just going to show you is just the correlation between the uh, best pre-oxygenation saturation and the saturation later. In other words, how well we could oxygenate the patients beforehand and how low the saturation dropped to uh, after the induction and during the um, intubation period. And there doesn't seem to be a clear correlation between those values, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, all of the data that we've collected, obviously it's an ongoing thing. There's, uh, this is the, the latest information that we have available from uh, the follow-ups with all of these patients. Um, but yeah, outcomes for the patients is obviously something that will become clearer as time, time passes. I'm gonna hand back to Ross uh, just to give us final thoughts. So, yeah, I think the, the critical thing here is we, we've been looking very hard for factors which may predict poor outcomes. Okay, so we you know, can spare some patients an intubation attempt which may have no bearing on their, on their final outcome. We got quite excited when we saw that there was this very strong correlation between saturation made and <coughs> patients who had early mortality. Uh, but unfortunately, by the time you have intubated, you to see your saturation made you have to actually intubate something. Um, and again, as Francis said, these are often very, very slick intubations. We're using high doses of succinothonium as our standard uh, muscle relax, and we're using uh, metomidate uh, or propofol as our uh, RSI induction agent. Uh, and a very high is the first part successor with the bougie. Still, these patients desaturate spectacularly. And I, I have personally had patient hit the saturations of zero, still with a good um, SATS trace. So uh, we were then hoping perhaps our best pre-oxygenation saturation would predict, and you could see if you couldn't get a patient saturations above, let's say, 75% with optimal pre-oxygenation with 100% O2 with a good mask seal with PEEP, etc. Perhaps that could be a sign to say maybe we should intubate this patient. But the correlation hasn't been as good as, as we wished for, so we, we're still looking. So perhaps just a few core lessons to wrap up from, from our experience. <clears throat> I think. Uh, one needs to be flowing through this process continuously of, of planning for how you're going, to, you're going to manage these patients, preparing for it, practicing those preparations, then pondering upon what you've done and what went well and, and poorly, and then, and then perfecting the systems. And certainly we've had the benefit of being able to do that iteratively, first through simulation and then through actual patient care. Standardizing your approach definitely helps when you, it helps strengthen the ad hoc teams that form at three o'clock in the morning when there's a sick patient who needs intubation. Uh, and I've certainly been overjoyed to uh, see physician colleagues who we met in the wards uh, you know, at the proverbial 3 a.m. Uh, who've turned to me and said, well, can I be hot one, please? And, and I've done the intubation and seamlessly formed part of that team. That, that's a huge strength. Uh, if one can have good infection prevention and control and, and use appropriate PPE and we can keep people safe, that breeds a lot of confidence and, and that you know, helps beat the virus. Uh, we do need to recognize, however, that, that 
PPE itself and these situations are very uncomfortable. So we need to get used to being uncomfortable and realizing that this is just part of what, what we're going to do to, uh, to manage the disease. Uh, creating bubbles of excellence, what I mean here is that uh, we are all working under adverse conditions wherever we are in the country. Some people's conditions feel more adverse uh, than others, but that doesn't stop us from trying to improve the situation as much as possible. Uh, and even if we can create a, a little bubble of really good patient care from when the sick patient needs to get intubated to get to ICU, that's ultimately going to happen. Then just for my colleagues out there, if you haven't yet intubated many of these patients, um, you're going to arrive on the ward and see an hypoxia like you've, you've never seen before. I, I think as a an airway and a thoracic anesthetist, I'm quite used to seeing patients who are quite hypoxic. As a wilderness medic, I'm quite used to being on high mountains and, and wandering around with saturations of 50 or 60%. But these patients really are spectacularly hypoxic and they desaturate profoundly and incredibly rapidly. So, so stay calm and remember the adage that uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Be deliberate uh, and, and be confident and the SATs will hopefully recover from it. And then in terms of looking after your colleagues, uh, you know, share the love, support each other, um, but maintain your social distancing and try not to, to share the virus. Just one uh, positive note to end on, and that is um, you know, we've been at this, as you can see, uh, since, since the middle of March. Uh, we've managed close to 500 patients. We've intubated 240-odd coronavirus patients for ICU. Uh, we've had 45 people in our team. We've had zero COVID infections. So good IPC, uh, looking after each other and, and using appropriate PPE really, really does work. But that's where I'm going to stop. Thanks very much, Ross, and, and thanks to you and Francois for a really fantastic overview of your experiences um, and, uh, and sharing the lessons that, that uh, you've learned and we've learned over the last five months. I think many of those lessons uh, apply to COVID, but also apply generically to the system. Um, and I also just want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank uh, Ross and all his colleagues uh, in the, from the anaesthetics department that have provided this service uh, to, the, to the COVID wards. I can't uh, overstate the, the role that it's played in, in the response at Critis Care Hospital and the success of the response to be able to call uh, colleagues with that expertise um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to know that uh, when you've got an acute, acutely unwell patient who needs to be intubated, that you've got experts that can come and help you out, do it safely. These patients who are, in, uh, are incredibly ill with uh, hypoxia, as you've said. Many of them, uh, you know, crash their sats on, on intubation, blood pressure drops. To have the, the, that expertise to call on to assist was, was just such a reassuring factor in our response allowed us to provide high quality services uh, and avoid a, a chaotic situation and really know that that transition from the, the ward to ICU was going to be done by the, by the best people possible in the hospital. So thanks very much for, for, for that contribution to you and, and all of the people in, in the uh, intubation teams. It was really appreciated. So then uh, we're going to move on to the panel discussion. And our panel today is, uh, consists of uh, uh, Professor Jastian Swanefelder, who's the head of anaesthetics at Kuliskia and UCT, and uh, uh, Associate Professor Sipa Glamini from uh, the uh, Division of Infectious Disease and HIV Medicine in the Department of Medicine. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Jastian first if, if he wants to make any comments uh, or has any questions for us uh, to, to start off with. Um, Mark, Graham, Wendy, and Department of Internal Medicine, uh, can you hear me? Is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I can just say thank you very much for allowing our Department of Anesthesia to participate in this. It's been a privilege, and we must never forget that it's a privilege to work with these type of patients and contribute to the bigger group. Remember that our department is a major massive ecosystem with many visible and invisible components. Um, nobody can anticipate every possible scenario as we couldn't in the beginning of this year. This unforeseen crisis has forced us into a state of sort of responsiveness and, and unparalleled adaptability and flexibility. And what I can say, our training as anesthetists, um, it is a privilege to have that to be trained and ready for to step up and do what Ross has done. 
Um, I have to give credit to Ross and his team, who have uh, many people have rotated through that. They have perfected this um, incubation group. Early on in this crisis, we divided the department almost into three um, different divisions, uh, many, and people have rotated through those. Uh, a big group were, were allocated to intensive care because we realized that's where our many of our skills are and the, a big need is. Ross was leading uh, this group of intubation team. Ivan Jubair, the intensive care uh, group, of course, elegantly had up to seven intensive care units, which he was um, guiding uh, during this past time. And then I have to give credit to the unsung heroes, the third group who were staying behind and delivering the service. Because remember, emergency medicine didn't go away. The emergency board was sort of varied in length. Uh, I say thank you to Richard Llewellyn, who sort of led that very elegantly. And um, obstetrics didn't go away. The other contribution from the department just carried on as usual. So we mustn't forget those people. Um, we could not have done all of this, any of this, without the excellent management of the hospital, Dr. Srikant Peterson, right up to Dr. Bernadette Eich and Bhavna Patel. I mean, really we had a hospital which was functional and therefore we could perform and shine. And then interacting with all the other wonderful departments, internal medicine were the main leaders and we could slot in and contribute where our skills were. And then not to forget the wellness of all the team members and how people coped with all of this during this time. Uh, we had early on had the involvement of the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology who sort of were constantly helping and guiding because you remember if people are involved in dying patients all the time, it is quite intense and people come in different ways and uh, some people, uh, you know, would just step up and, but people were uh, at different stresses and different precious uh, and one must recognize that the wellness of the team uh, needed constant uh, finger on the pulse and and guidance so um a big group ross really had a fantastic um team around him i'm very proud to say young registrars and medical officers came into this team and stepped up and within a week or two they would be acting like senior people, really decision makers and leaders, and we're very proud of that. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Yaskin. That's a really important addition. So, Simpo, any comments or questions that you wanted to bring to the discussion? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks very much. And I, I think I just want to echo your, uh, everybody's sentiments and just congratulate uh, uh, Ross and his team and the anesthetic department for, 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 for this major contribution to supporting the airway, especially for us who are working in the ward. Um, uh, Ross highlighted a number of things in terms of, you know, the lessons learned and some of the challenges. And uh, I, I'm just uh, cognizant there may be colleagues who are in centers which were, may not be as resourced as ours. And uh, a question to you, Ross, and just in reflecting, um, uh, the one question is, um, is an airway team something that would be feasible for other centers which are not, uh, say, tertiary centers? Um, you've highlighted that you, you know, the ideal team should be five people, but you've, you've suggested that uh, a two-member airway team is doable um, once people are experienced. And then the second uh, uh, question uh, is, is just relating to, um, obviously, for the airway team, moving into the wards was probably a new thing, and the question is about um, uh, were the induction agents uh, that are, uh, uh, were used previously for sort of intubations, the kinds of medications that you would want, uh, uh, is that something that looking forward you would, um, would change? I mean, what are the things that you would have uh, adapted in the wards uh, to make um, uh, this uh, airway team uh, have a seamless process? Yeah, well, thanks, Siva. I think. Um, in answering your question, I have to pay homage to the fact that, much as Professor was saying, you know, these things have worked because uh, we've been within inside a complex system where many different people have come to the party. 
uh, and you know everyone has brought their, their own facet, and that's that's made it stronger. In terms of the challenges of resource constraints, you know, we are sitting in a much better situation uh, here in the Cape than I think many people are around the country. Uh, but the, the most important facets of what we've done have not been uh, you know, having expensive video radioscopes or having fancy transport ventilators, although those devices are incredibly useful and certainly streamline the process. The most important facets of what we've done have been uh, things like in situ simulation of, of training with groups in the wards, in the environments that we're going to work. It's been simple things like the use of checklists. Uh, I haven't gone into too much detail about how we've set the system up because it's all that documentation that's available freely online. But for instance, we pack all of our bags of kit, uh, we pre pack three different types of bags so that when we need to go and do an intubation, we can just grab those three different bags and it's just plastic packets. Uh, and off we go, and we know we've got all of the bits and pieces we need for that type of situation. Now, that's a very, very low tech, uh, low resource you know, thing to do is to just pre pack uh, the right endotracheal tubes and tube tie and bag on mask, etc., into, into set of bags. Then again, around the issue of having enough people for an intubation team, the reason why we only need to send two people down to a ward now to go to intubation, do an intubation is because through that early simulation and then later iteratively through doing so many of these intubations, I know that many of the nurses who are on the ward know exactly what the different roles are. Many of our, our colleague physicians who are on the wards, uh, the interns, uh, the surgeons who have been brought into those areas, they know how the roles work. And so because we've broken down those silos and we've trained together, we can absorb people and create ad hoc teams uh, on the spur of the moment and the roles are defined. And, that, and that's the incredible strength of the standardization. Uh, you know, for instance, early when we started, we would take two carts to every single intubation, one which would be our hot trolley we would pack the equipment out onto, uh, and one which had spare supplies of everything we could possibly need, including our own little drug box so we could pull our drugs from. Within the first week or two, the nursing staff on the wards, uh, we'd arrive and say, sister, do you maybe have some atonet? And she'd pull out a kidney dish and lay it on the table, and it would have exactly all the drugs that we needed because they had immediately become used to the standard that we did. We, we in fact, in certain environments, uh, standardized to the point that, uh, particularly where there were non-anesthetic staff doing intubations, such as in the trauma unit, we agreed upon a, a, a recipe with certain particular you know, contraindications. We agreed, okay, for every intubation, unless there's a contraindication, you're going to use a tomate at this dose as our induction agent, uh, suction of, uh, the suction of colon at this dose as our paralytic, we're going to follow up our, our induction with sedation using this drug, and ongoing paralysis using that drug. Um, and that standardization has helped, has helped dramatically. Uh, and, and I think to what Professor Swanefelder was saying, it also gives those junior doctors uh, a structure and they can say, okay, I've got a plan, there is a standard plan, I'm going to step up and, uh, and I'm going to do that. While I'm on the topic of drugs, can I answer a question quickly that I saw that popped up there? Yeah, the yeah. yeah, so somebody asked about uh, our paralytics. Uh, and because we want very rapid intubating conditions, we're using uh, saxophonium or saxophonium as our, uh, our standard muscle relaxant. And we're using that at a one to two milligram per kilo dose with actually a, a, a preponderance quite heavy hand that we often use two milligrams per kilo uh, of suck. So it's quite useful for us to draw up 200 milligrams uh, to go and do an intubation. We do, however, uh, have on our checklist, uh, checking the latest uh, potassium because we're aware of the renal disease that goes with COVID, uh, as well as the fact that some of these patients have got electrolytes uh, derangements. So that's actually in our pre-intubation checklist on the back of our CRF is to double check the potassium. And if we're concerned, then we use rock uranium again at, at, a, at an RSI dose of 1.6 milligrams per kilo. We always draw up rock anyway, because as soon as the tube is even secured, uh, we then give up post-intubation sedation and post-intubation paralysis. And that's partially just because these patients can be a challenge to ventilate, but also uh, because when we transfer them to ICU, we do not want a patient who starts waking up or coughing. Uh, and, uh, and if we, we have a tube uh, disconnect to connect a uh, ICU ventilator, we want to have apps you know, stop the ventilation and no air movement to the materialization. So that's our, our standardized approach. Well, can I just ask one? Sipa, was there anything else that you wanted to add, or was that all? That's yeah, that's fine. OK, thanks very much, Sipa. Thanks, Yaskia. Ross, can I just ask one question? I mean, it was dramatic to see the drop in, in uh, oxygen saturation from a pre-oxygenation just under 90 down into the 60s on average. 
just to give us a sense, what is the what was the time between the patient coming off oxygen to getting onto the the, the ventilator? So uh, on average, because I mean that's a dramatic jump, and then I think that that will illustrate how uh, yeah. critical so these patients. It, it, it's it's absolutely spectacular, yeah. and. Uh, there was also another question about how are we pre oxygenating So yeah. in the operating theatre, we're using a circuit system with a, a well-fitting anesthetic mask with a two-handed yeah. seal, uh, and we're dialing in a, just a little bit of peak to, to help oxygenate. In the ward setting, that's obviously not available to us. There we use a bag of mass device. We connect the oxygen at high flow, so yeah. we flow 25 or 30 or more liters a minute into it. Uh, and we, we routinely use a peak valve on our bag of mask. We actually have that through a, a, a high efficiency particular hydro filter to prevent um, uh, aerosolization. We then, in our checklist, the person who's holding the mask does so with a two-hand seal to make sure we get a good face seal. Yeah. Uh, and we, we maintain that until the sats stabilize or until we've been doing it for two or three minutes yeah. while we run through the rest of the checklist. Uh, we then induce the patient, as I say, most patients with, uh, with sucks. So typically between the induction agent and the sucks going in and the patient is starting to fasciculate, it's about 35 to 45 seconds. Yeah. As soon as the patient is fasciculating, uh, our, our hot two roll turns the oxygen off, so we don't blow oxygen through that filter that's not contaminated. Yeah. Uh, we put that down, pick up the video the scope, uh, and, and I can say I'm very proud of my team, their intubations are slick. There's a, probably about 15 seconds between the laryngoscope getting picked up and the tube going, yeah. going through the cords. As I say, we use a standard technique with a bougie for every intubation, uh, and it's preloaded with a technique that we've actually done some previous yeah. research on, so it's fast. That then gets connected to the ventilator, which is already prepped with both suction and a filter and a circuit, and the, the ventilator is immediately, immediately yeah. turned on. So I, I think we've, on average, probably got a time between the induction agent going in and the ventilation commencing of not more than 90 seconds. Uh, and some of the intubations are probably between the patients actually stopping breathing and ventilation starting, probably in the range of about 30 seconds. Occasionally we have difficulty, but I think that's more or less our average time. Yeah. In fact, many times the patient is only just beginning to desaturate by the time the tube moves through the cords. Of course, we don't have to inflate yeah. the cuff, take over, etc. But the saturation mainly it doesn't happen during the intubation. It, you see the sats continue to fall even after the ventilator is connected, as that huge oxygen deficit uh, needs to be overcome. And then with ventilation, then they slowly start to start to pick up again. If, if you are not anticipating it or you're not used to it, it is a terrifying yeah. desaturation. And that's why I warn people about it, sir, because it really is a big problem. Of course, you know, this is a situation where these patients are classical physiological difficult airways. They've got high oxygen demand, poor FRC, uh, and, and poor oxygen uh, transport. Yeah. The ideal way to manage that would be the use of, of things like apneic oxygenation. So I would love to leave high flow cannily on the patient maintain a draw thrust and let them be oxygenated while we're doing the intubation. Uh, the danger of that, of course, is that it's just going to greatly increase the, the aerosolization and, and I'm, I don't want to risk our staff by doing that. Just a last quick question, Ross, how are you pre-oxygenating? Uh, right, so, so circle system with a two-handed grip with a face mask in theatre, uh, or a bag valve mask with an anesthetic mask and a peep valve, uh, with a two-handed grip if we are outside the operating theatre. And again, uh, the bag valve mask has always been a reservoir and we flow 25 or 30 litres a minute into that reservoir because these patients are very, very, very tacky. Uh, we try and keep that bag fully inflated. We use for pre oxygenation between 5 and 10 centimetres of water peep on the valve. Uh, more than that, I get worried about accidental aerosolization around the mask. Uh, and, and less than that, I don't know if you're getting as much value out of the peep. And Ross, can I just ask you, you know, Atlanta mentioned the issue of hypotension after intubation, and I saw that a few times when I watched your team in action, is that a few of these patients become quite profoundly hypertensive. Uh, you know, I think one has to consider that they were often on high flow oxygen, profoundly distressed, and, and had poor uh, oral intake, and probably quite dehydrated, some of them might have had cardiac issues. And uh, sort of the approach to that issue and preventing it and managing it? So, so there's, there's two big things to this question. And the one is the fact that I agree with you. I think the insensible losses in these patients are quite high. And certainly in the peak of the pandemic, the wards were very busy. Uh, we, we would quite often find patients whose IVs had other tissue or didn't have an IV yeah, yeah. Um, and had been on high flow for a few days. Uh, and, and before we really clicked as to what the problem was, yeah. uh, and also when we were still using propofol, which is, you know, has got myocardial as well as uh, vasopagic effects, 
uh, we saw some patients become hypotensive to the point of, of you know, a periuresis uh, situation. Uh, we shifted our practice somewhat. We, for these really sick patients, we use more intomidate for its cardiac stability. Yeah. But also, we now, again, on our checklist, we brought in something about checking for a functional IV and actually giving a crystalloid preload yeah. prior to uh, prior to induction. It's now something they get phoned to come and do an intubation. That the person on the other line says, "Can we do anything to prepare so long?" I say, "Could you check the patient about an IV and just start running in five hundred mils of fluid?" And so, the other problem that we recognise is that many of these patients have got advanced COVID and we, and we know that that's got significant myocardial effects. Yeah. Uh, and you know, a 3% rate of a peri-induction arrest is actually, for an anesthetist, that's terrifying. We shouldn't have um, you know, one in 30 patients arresting on induction. We would not uh, be very employable if that were the case. Uh, and, and I think that we, we sometimes forget and underestimate how poor these patients' myocardial are functioning. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually, we need to be fairly cautious uh, with, the, with the, the drug doses that we're using, but also very, very, very supportive. We saw about 15% of our patients require inotropic boluses around uh, induction, and it's now become our standard practice where it wasn't at the beginning that we will draw up some form of, of inotropic, often dilute adrenaline, because we, we recognize the requirement for that. I mean, I wonder if, if um, the fact that patients had had told me MLI as well could contribute to that high risk rate. Absolutely. Yeah. Michael, are there any other questions? Just I think the last one, which is probably fairly, fairly important because we, as you mentioned, uh, was the issue around many of these patients may start being, uh, you know, in the process of requiring tracheostomies. Are you assisting the ENTs? Are they best done in the theatre situation, in the control situation? What is your recommendation? Yeah, so uh, in fact, uh, addressing tracheostomies has been something specifically we've done with our COVID anesthesia team. Um, and, and that's been in conjunction with our, with our ENT surgeons and with the ICU teams. Uh, the, the challenges of these patients is that obviously you, you want to be cautious about tracheostomy being an aerosol generating procedure itself, particularly when they're inside the trachea, if you're ventilating and you blow uh, um, you know, gas through an open neck, that, that's a big problem. But also these patients are quite tenuous to, to transport. What we now do with our ENTs is uh, we, we actually are just using a WhatsApp group so that all the intensivists as well as the ENTs as well as our representatives of our COVID anesthesia team are on the group. Um, the, the ICU staff post the patients who they think are suitable for tracheostomies. The ENTs who are on call go and assess those patients and they make a call as to whether they are comfortable with the patient being done percutaneously in ICU uh, or in the operating theatre. Even for the ICU tracheostomies for COVID patients, we still have a surgeon and assistant, a scrub nurse, a diathermy machine, and surgical lighting, and a proper uh, tracheostomy tray in the ICU because we've had one or two uh, wobbles in that process. And uh, that's allowed us to do quite a significant proportion of our COVID trachees without having to move the patient. If they're worried about the surgical access of the difficult patient, uh, then we take the patients to our COVID theatre. And our standard practice of doing that now uh, is that if the patient's not already on a protocol infusion, we'll start them on a protocol target control infusion, take them to theatre on their ICU ventilator so there's never a disconnection, uh, do the tracheostomy in ICU under propofol anesthesia, uh, and then take them back to ICU on the, uh, on the ICU ventilator once again. Uh, we, we've come up with a little mnemonic to remind people prior to making a decision, you must make sure, prior to treating the decision, you must make sure your PBS is up to date. Uh, and that's, that's for the patient, must be pre oxygenated. Um, they must be paralyzed fully so they can't cough. Uh, and then you must stop the ventilator before the incision so you don't aerosolize gas. Mm -hmm. What we also do, which is based on uh, good practice uh, came from internationally, is we try and encourage the ICU teams to do an apnea test on the patients prior to booking them for a tracheostomy. Mm -hmm. If the patient cannot tolerate 90 seconds of apnea without profound desaturation, then we know we're going to have trouble with the trachea. Uh, in fact, in one or two cases where we've been less fastidious about doing that, we've seen patients become profoundly um, hypoxic and bradycardic, which is not a situation we want to be in, in a semi-elective uh, tracheostomy. That's well, just a quick point. Uh, N95s are what you're standardly using as part of your PPE for, for AGBs. So uh, for our team, the vast majority are using reusable elastomeric uh, respirators. So we're using 3M respirators and encapsulated filters. Uh, we can then spray those down with surface alcohol, not getting alcohol inside the filters. Uh, and then actually uh, we, we soak the masks in a hypochlorite uh, solution. So that's saved the hospital 
thousands of uh, in, of M95s over the you know the course of us doing procedures. Uh, if one doesn't have the usable respirators, or if you prefer to use the disposables, then obviously you want at least an N95 standard. Uh, you know, if if the masks are truly passing the KN95 standard, then that's perfectly adequate. I think the major concern is a lot of the masks that have been either donated or imported that say KN95, but it's very hard to know if they really are understand. In fact, SASA has been very active in trying to uh, chase this down. There's some very nice SASA guidance on different respirators. We've got actual guidance on, on the usual respirators and the cleaning of them. These are all open access documents. On your website. Yep. Uh, all people can just drop me a line. Uh, and uh, SASA is also independently actually now testing a lot of the masks that are being brought in. Uh, where the, the testing standard is not clearly determinable from the packaging, sometimes because it's uh, in the Chinese script. Okay, great. So um, thanks, Ross. Thanks to all the speakers and the panel members today. I really appreciate everybody's contribution. I think we've had a fantastic session. Uh, and we'll have the next webinar next week, uh, Wednesday at 4 p.m. Our speaker next week is Mark Mendelssohn, and Mark will be reviewing the uh, emerging data or the evolving data surrounding the issue of the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. And I think that's where we look forward to a very exciting update on, on that issue. So we'll see you again next week. Thanks very much. Thank you, Graham. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Again, uh, every week we sit here, but we forget there's a whole back-end team. We thank Karen Fenton, Cheryl Valentine from, uh, from Project ECHO and the Gastro Foundation, and then to um, so Hunter Agnell and uh, Claire Jeffrey from the Department of Medicine for loading up videos, sending out invitations. Thank you very much to everybody who makes this possible. See you next week.